Yeah, so in, in the 70s, there was a decision scientist named Herbert Simon um, who pointed out that uh, in, as information um, grows, what remains scarce is attention. And that, uh, so he made some predictions that lead to kind of the concept of the attention economy. And it, it, this is the fundamental challenge for any business today is that we have more things than ever before as people, as consumers in the world. Um, you just think of any sector, um, meditation. Um, there's been 2,500 meditation apps that have been launched in the Play Store and App Store since 2017. Um, so no matter what a person in the world is trying to do, they have a lot of ways to do it and solve for it and a lot of comparative you know, alternatives that they could do to pursue their, their needs. And so how do, you, how do you exist and kind of preserve the attention and interest of your customer in that world? Um, Often we call it a data problem. I spent my career as a data scientist, but uh, it's, only, it's only partly a data problem. Actually, we all have a lot of data that we've generated in our systems um, across different point of sale systems and um, our websites and our apps, et cetera. Uh, but the real problem is the fact that we have to activate that data. We have to use it. And so whether that's kind of figuring out who a high value user is and then kind of uh, working with the CRM team to send out a push notification campaign or something like this. Each one of these is basically a bottleneck um, of a team that needs to do something to action it in order to kind of come up with a, uh, a way of engaging with that customer. And what you find yourself in a situation with is that each of those teams has to grow in order to scale as your business scales. It doesn't work. Um, and so let's look at an example of what does work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so Spotify, hopefully everyone in the room is familiar with Spotify. Spotify is our masters in user engagement. They have over 600,000 monthly active users. Uh, let's take a peek behind the curtain at what they do. So this is Spotify and one of their competitors, Deezer. So it's worth noting that Deezer came out the year before Spotify, has just as many songs available as Spotify, but only a small fraction of the subscriber base. And there's one thing I want you to notice. I did make arrows and circles, so hopefully it's easier to notice. One is how they categorize their music. So Deezer uses categories, the common ones we expect to see, R&B, rock, hip hop, things like that. Spotify, you notice, uses very different and distinct words. Scream, sharp, they use these vivid words to explain their songs. In fact, Spotify says they have over 6,000 genres of music, and some of them are made up. Nobody knows what yacht rock is until you hear it. So, so why do they do this, though? Why do they do it? Well, one is they know not all rock is rock, not all hip hop is hip hop. We can simultaneously love and hate multiple songs in the same broad category at the same time. So breaking down these songs into finer categories allows them to do better personalization and recommendations. But they can also use these categories to teach users about themselves, teach listeners about themselves. And this is the Spotify rap campaign. We all know that, right? One of the most successful viral engagement campaigns that they have. So if we take this and compare it now with what we see in e-commerce and retail for categories, we see the broad categories, men's, women's, kids, shirts, pants. Can we do the same level of personalization? Can we teach customers about themselves the same way Spotify can with these categories? Of course not. Um, that's why Spotify has the categories they have and uses the system they use. So, when we interact as humans, when we're recommending something to a, to a human, we're using this rich vocabulary, something like 180,000 words in the English language. Um, and that's what allows us to kind of convey our style, what we like, whether, you know, whether it's fashion, et cetera. So, um, but our technology can't do that. And it can't do it because of the way historically we've built software. Um, Digitization is not that old, 30, 40 years now. Personal computer, and then we moved applications onto the web, and then we, the smartphone came, launched right, iPhone in 2008, and so we moved things into the, into the phone. But what we were basically doing is taking the architecture of a physical store and just putting it behind a screen. The same kind of throw everything there, anything you could possibly want. Um, the next phase of software, all of that was a rep sort of an analogy of a rule of here's all the ways I can categorize my product and you go in and you find it. But again, with the profusion of information, all those items, how does a given person in the small amount of they time they have to make that decision, how do they navigate all that complexity? The next phase of software we call software 2.0 is agentic software, where it makes certain decisions 
in order to learn the preferences of a person the way a, a human would, in order to interact with them in a way that reflects their interests and helps them develop their own interests. Um, what we're going to talk about today with a bunch of examples is what does that agentic our infrastructure look like? What do our CDPs and our data stacks of the future that our agentic look like? Well, there's four basic capabilities that agents need to have in order to be able to do the things that, uh, let's say, a Spotify or Netflix will be doing. Um, and we're going to talk through them uh, now. So we'll get some embeddings, edges, and weights. We're, let's make those a little bit more real for you. All right, so surrogates. Um, not every customer visit ends in a purchase, right? And that should be OK. If we make our messaging, if we make our product try to push every message, push someone into making a purchase, that's like asking how many kids you want on a first date. A little pushy. People don't appreciate that. In reality, people's journeys are back and forth. They're much more complex than the simplistic flows that we often make. Um, so here is one example of an actual customer journey and interaction. Uh, and what you'll notice is the user activity is those gray humps and the dots on the top. The blue dots on the bottom are interactions from the agent to the customer. And what you'll notice is there's concentrations around when a user is active, when a customer is active, the agent is active. And when the customer needs to take a breather, so does the agent. So you see not a fixed cadence, but one that's organic and adaptable to the individual user's needs. So compare that to this customer, very highly active, higher uh, message volume. And what you'll notice is if we did the same message volume with the first customer, we'd probably cause them to churn. They'd be overwhelmed. But if we did a lower message cadence with this user, um, we'd be missing a lot of opportunities. So what agentic systems allow you to do is to be adaptable to each user's preferences and their tolerance for messaging and interactions. And what we see when we do this, um, when when companies use an agentic approach, we generally send far less messages because we're not on a fixed cadence. But you'll see the conversions go up and retention increase. Not a single one of those decisions is made by a human in the system of like, send this message now. It's an agent that's learning the person and then running small experiments. So how do the agents run those experiments efficiently? They have to have a way of representing that person. And they do that with something called an embedding. Um, an embedding takes the click stream of data that our systems are generating. Every time someone swipes through your website or swipes through your app, it's registering a, an event, a timestamp with a user ID, with a, a description of what that event was. Often these events are happening in the milliseconds level. And so what the agent's going to be doing is basically transforming that log of things into this very large, rep high dimensional space representation for that person. So that each agent can work with other agents to find similar users, to cluster them dynamically into comparison groups, and then take a message or take a product or take a SKU and run it as a treatment, one of those tags that, you know, that we talked about, um, and run that experiment to sort of see for that kind of person how are they responding uh, and, and what are they going to do if we try this or try that. Um, what this means is that you're also kind of constantly uh, thinking about that user in their unique place. So if that, traditionally, if they didn't fall into one of your segments that you have a campaign for, you didn't message them. So this is a, a leading um, um, e-commerce super app in, 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 the, in the Middle East, in Dubai, Gulf, and Saudi, and Egypt, uh, where after about four months of running, that they saw that they were significantly increasing the um, the reach of their messaging because they were no longer running on the typical uh, four or five segments that they'd set up around active users, churned users, lurking users. So the next one is edges. So edges are similarities between products and offering. And we'll get to how tags make those even more powerful. So this is a Netflix show page. You, most of you have probably seen something like this. Something very interesting to note you may not have noticed before is they have things like the cast and the genre, but they also have this section that says this show is. So the Umbrella Academy is offbeat. It's quirky. They use, again, like Spotify, these common words that we use to explain the shows to our friends. Why this matters. Well, if we built a recommender system and we built it off of common attributes on a show, we might say someone watched Breaking Bad. Brian Cranston is an actor. Let's recommend Kung Fu Panda 3, because he must be a giant Brian Cranston fan. In this case, it's completely dissimilar, right? So the recommendation may work, it may not. 
using these tags, we have things like if you watched Breaking Bad, uh, Breaking Bad is described as gritty or dark. You might be interested in John Wick, which would be a much more accurate, uh, similar to the same show recommendation. Netflix, similar to Spotify, has over 3,000 of these tags and a team of 30 tag managers that maintain them, make sure they're accurate for the show, that they're, um, that they're effective, right? And they say every time they pull these tags off of their user experience, their engagement plummets. It's a very, very powerful tool. And really, uh, there are tags and signals all over our products. Um, the tags are attributes of the different products and offerings we have, and the signals are the way that our customers are able to express the way that they feel about them, right? Add to carts, purchases, likes, things like that. Uh, it's up to us in the infrastructure we use to be able to use them effectively. So a quick example from industry, uh, Timu, <laughs> everyone here is probably familiar with them. They have uh, the same basic categories, so men's, women's, kids, things like that. But if you look, they have these sub-menus like vacation, elegant, party. These are great for discovery. They help people find new things that they wouldn't otherwise look for if they were just going for a shirt, for example. But it allows them to do some unique things as well. So as we're adding new products, what should we call them? Well, it would take a team to manually decide how we should classify each item, or if we're using an agentic approach, we could perhaps notice that a large amount of users who like chic fashion also interact with this dress, view it, add it to cart, uh, click attributes of it, and we can classify it as chic. And this is adaptable, so as people change and preferences change and our offerings change, we're able to dynamically change how we classify uh, our products. So. Um, the ages are basically building this taxonomy. Rather than you traditionally creating that taxonomy in your back end and then showing it in your front end, you're letting the agents generate the possible versions, then run the experiments in order to learn the preferences. So now, how do the agents manage that at the user level? What they're doing is using a concept of weights. So every time they try to send a message, everything, every message, every u u interface is programmatically injected with those different tags and labels, the, the way we showed the interface, right? And then the agent develops this score repository, this representation, this embedding of your tags, of your categories, of your product, um, in order to learn what is the preference for a given user. Now, what AMP does and what a tool, usually the user identifies how you're engaging as a product person or as a marketing leader uh, with an agentic system is thinking strategically about that library of tags. Your job is to think about those and to think about how you cultivate and develop them. And the agent's job is to match those and find the users that are responding to them and learn those preferences along those tags. Um, and then what ends up happening is that then your recommenders improve because you're getting a more rich representation of that user's preferences. It's no longer just clicked mail, clicked pants, clicked shoes, it's clicked chic. And uh, the really cool thing is, is that then this can, can actually become injected into the interface itself. We mostly live in a world today where when you open the app, you see the exact same thing as me. We see the same product. It's just the description that came from the catalog, from the inventory. It's the same thing. But that doesn't need to happen, and that's going to rapidly change, because what agentic systems allow is to, us to, di to generate more specific copy, more specific framings within the interface itself. So you have the same pair of pants, but the way it's described, is it affordable or popular or luxury? That becomes reflected in the interface for the user. And then you start to sort of see, as the agents run these interfaces and, and populate your messaging, um, how different people respond and, uh, and how the, the treatments themselves are performing, um, which tells you something about the, the demographics and the interests of your user base, of your customer set. Yes, we'll do a couple quick examples just to give you guys ideas of other places where agentic systems play. Um, one is in chat, so chat is always a terrible experience because no matter who you are, where you exist, what you have done, you always end up with the same chat experience. Every, user, every customer has to teach the chatbot every single time what they're interested in. Uh, agentic systems allow you to uh, take all of that you've learned about a customer and then 
pre-apply it, load it into the chatbot before the user even starts their interaction so that when they do start their interaction, the chatbot becomes part of your overall experience instead of being a little side journey. Um, it now participates uh, and feeds into the experience that, the custom, that your customer has with your app or site. Um, and again, so labeled learning drives higher conversions because as the chatbot is learning not only what the customer is interested in or what they have bought before, but also understanding the why and the how and even the tone, that a tone of voice that the customer likes to be communicated with, um, we see improvement across the board. This is really important because if you, if, you have, if you just launch an LLM on your product, the issue again is that a language model doesn't contain a repository for a user, so it's just responding to an immediate prompt. Now if your CRM or your lifecycle, your other marketing systems are operating independently, then there's no systematic programmatic way to prompt your chatbot, your LLM, to respond to that person with the history of what you've learned about them already. The Genetic system allows that to, ha to happen because the agent just passes the embedding into the prompt behind what the user sees, and then the, 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 when the user puts in their prompt, the chatbot can then respond to that plus the system prompt, leading to a much kind of cleaner, faster, more efficient process of getting to um, you know, helping that customer figure out what they want. Now, something similar happens with recommender systems. That's the last example we'll give uh, about how agentic systems are changing the way we use recommender systems. Recommender systems are incredibly powerful. Most businesses rank uh, a pretty high impact on what their system is doing for them. But we also know that they have a lot of problems. And uh, we use a lot of them, but a lot of times what will happen is Something like Amazon will have many. The, the reason um, they'll have these different modals in the application is because those, the thing that's populating the modal is referring to something different. If you go back to the example of music, sometimes I want to hear music like the Beatles and I want to hear something like the Beatles. But sometimes I'm done with that and I want to hear something very different. So it might be you know, in terms of my you know, what I'm more recently listening to. right? So what uh, an agentic system will let, it, will let you do is, is run many possible recommenders. And then the agents have access to those recommenders, systematically experiment with the recommendations. So this is a leading food delivery app that uses us, an agentic system in India called Swiggy. And um, they run six or seven that the data science team runs through the agentic system. Um, and you send a message that gets populated with that particular recommender. And you learn the context in which uh, a popular recommender operates versus your history. So sometimes you want the recommendation based on what you've been eating lately. Sometimes you want something entirely fresh and you want to know what's hot in the market and like what are other people enjoying. And when you choose one system, when, you have, when your system is rigid, when you're using software 1.0 that requires you to program the system to do exactly what you tell it, it, it it's never as optimal because this is a fundamental reality of, of business today is that our customers are diverse. They respond to different things. So this is an example of another uh, super uh, a fashion retail app that uses in Asia, Southeast Asia, where they're running several. And you can see that the performance of the very best system still is only working best for that user uh, for about 45% of the users during the time period of this snapshot. Um, and so if you, even if you, if you picked the best system, you'd still only be working best for the largest minority of your users. Whereas when you have all of them possible, able to be running, uh, and then agents can selectively pull them in and use them in the, tree, in the interface that they're working on, the surface area they're working on, you get a much better experience. And it can be continuous. So again, because it's an agentic system, it's not like your CRM work system sends out campaigns that are fixed and static, and then your, your website is operating completely independently. An agentic system means that the agent is following that user and the thing that they send in the notification is learning and then changing what's shown on the website when they load the website. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so our big takeaways in the attention economy, the biggest challenge is how to attract and renew user attention. So attention is now our greatest focus. Um, current tech exacerbates the problem by imposing non-scalable rules that we discussed. Uh, and AI agents and agentic systems can remove those human limitations and bottlenecks and achieve true user level experiences. <laughs>